All right, guys. So next, let's look at what we call Rayleigh criterion. This one assumes that instead of one source generating the light that goes through an opening, now we have two sources. For example, here I have source one and I have source two. That means through the opening of through one slit, you have two different uh, light, could be even different wavelength of light. So they don't have to be coherent. They can be non-coherent. Um, then when they go through those two openings, then what you get, what you see here, you see um, diffraction patterns. Okay. Now, one of the things we have here is what type of diffraction pattern you will see and what will be our ability to distinguish those diffraction patterns of each source will depend on how close those sources are to one another and it would depend on this angle theta. All right. So you can see that you have, you know, image A and image B. What we have for image A is the theta is relatively large. Source one and source two are far from one another. And then you see, you know, diffraction pattern for the source two completely separates from the diffraction pattern of source one. And what you will see here then in terms of you will see that let's say this one being exactly at the, you know, right below the peak over there. This one exactly at the peak of the second one, but you will be able to distinguish both of those uh, patterns. Now, for the image B, then source one and two are very close to one another and theta is too small um, compared to theta in, in image one. And then when the light goes through the opening of those source one and source two, they generate two uh, diffraction pattern, but those two diffraction patterns are too close to one another. And if you view it on the screen, you might not be able to distinguish them, okay? So those images might not be what we call resolved. All right, that means um, what we're gonna be looking at here is what are the sort of like the minimum requirement for the uh, our system to be able to distinguish those two sources. And this is, you know, generally very important for astronomy uh, where you have two stars far away from one another. And you, when you look at the star uh, or, you know, not necessarily far away, but two, two distant stars. Uh, when you look at those distant stars, if they're too close to one another, our optical instruments might not be able to distinguish them, might not be able to separate them. And instead of like, let's say, you know, let's say two stars like this, if they're too close, our, you know, our optical instruments might show us like, let's say one blob. So like, let's say one uh, bright spot without necessarily uh, being able to distinguish which one is star A, which one is star B. We might not even be able to tell that there are two different stars. So that, those are the important things that we're gonna be now looking at. All right, so again, in terms of then what we have here is our, our goal here is to make sure that theta here is large enough so that we can um, distinguish those two uh, diffraction patterns. That means we need to have some kind of minimum, um, let's say, uh, angle theta, right? For which we can then have a pattern for a, a diffraction pattern for source one separate from source two. All right, that means what we have here is this. When the central maximum of one image falls on the first minimum of another image, the images are said to be just resolved. This limiting condition of resolution is known as a Riley criterion. So that's why you can see, right? So um, what we have over here, um, that's the requirement that the central maximum of one image falls on the first minimum of another image. Okay, in that case, we should be able to see. And that's kind of like what we have over here, right? So this is the first minimum and this is the first maximum and uh, it doesn't fall on that. That means, you know, like, let's say what we have is that this is not on top of the other one. That means it's gonna be hard for us to distinguish the, the patterns. So we need at least, you know, have this one right here so we can be able to, you know, separate them. All right, so that's kind of what we have in this image. That means the Riley criterion to determine minimum angle of separation, theta minimum, subtended by sources at, at slit for which images just resolved. First minimum in single slit diffraction patterns occurs at an angle for which 
we have the sine of theta. Remember, this is sine of theta equals m times lambda over a, but we're taking m equals one for this to be the uh, the first minimum, and a being the the width of the slit. So then we can look at this to be the minimum, right? So the, this is this is the minimum angle theta what we want that we want. Generally, the sine of theta is approximately theta. So then we can just replace theta uh, uh, for sine of theta with theta, and then we can say that theta minimum is equals to lambda over a, where m is, you know, assumed to be one in this case. All right, so that means this expression gives smallest angular separation in radians, right, for which two images result. Because lambda is much smaller than a in most situations, sine of theta is small, so we can use the sine of theta approximately theta, okay. That means this is the limiting angle of resolution for slit of width a so if in order for us to be able to separate, that means we can use this uh, information about the wavelength of the light and then the width of the opening of the slit to calculate this theta minimum, okay? And for any theta that is greater than this, we will have no problem separating. Any theta less than this, then we're gonna have a difficult time separating those two sources. All right, so in a way then we can have two different, uh, let's say openings, right? So we can have a slit uh, or we can have a sort of like a circular, you know, opening. So now the equation that I showed you that was for the slit. That means if I come back here, I can say that this is for the slit. Okay. So for the slit, we can then use this equation to calculate the minimum, um, minimum angle okay, or, the, or the limiting angle. Uh, whenever we have then um, a circular apertures, that means our opening, uh, sort of like, let's say maybe it's, it's a, you know, something like this, an opening is like a, 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 sort of like, let's say circular rather than just a slit. In that case, then the theta minimum is equals to 1.22 times lambda over D, where D here is then the diameter of the aperture rather than A, which is the width of the slit. And then 1.22, it's an it's a information that comes from the mathematical analysis. So. Uh, it, it's basically something that is beyond the scope of this class. So just think of it like, let's say, this is just all of, always part of the class, uh, part of the, the, the equation, if you dealing with the circular apertures, okay? That means the, the difference between um, slit and you know, circular apertures will be if the problem tells you the width of the slit relative to the, let's say, compared to the diameter of the, uh, let's say, aperture, right? So then it will, you, know, you will be able to, um, understand if you're dealing with the, you know, just a one, a single slit or just basically with a circular aperture. Okay. So again, you can see in the, in the diagrams, we have A, B, and C. So A gives you uh, the sources are far apart and the patterns are well resolved, right? So you can see two different, you know, uh, let's say diffraction patterns. Um, and you can see that uh, the requirement was that the, you know, the minimum of the first one, right? you know, is more or less um, sort of like, or the maximum of the second one is above or further from the, uh, from the other pattern uh, than the first minimum. That means what you have here is, this is the first maximum of the second pattern. And it is uh, basically a little bit to the left of the uh, minimum of the first pattern, where blue is the first one, red is the second one. Here, this is basically the um, the dark spot, right? So the first minima of the of the blue wave, uh, the blue wave, let's call that. So then this is the red, where you can see that right now what you have here is this is sort of like let's say the minimum you can have, where the maximum of the red is right on top of the minimum of the blue. That means here you can you know you can say that this is what we call. Uh, you know, the, just the minimum requirement to satisfy the Riley criterion. And after that, if let's say here's the minimum and here's the maximum, what you're gonna see is you're not gonna be able to separate them, okay? So this is what we get. Even though there are two sources, but we can't really separate them because they're too close to one another and an angular, um, angular distance between them, right? Um, is just smaller than the theta minimum. So, um, Here's two images on the left side is the image of Pluto and 
Charon, which is the uh, the moon of Pluto. So this is taken, um, you can see right in 1978. So at the time, um, you know, the, the image was taken probably some, some, some kind of uh, Earth-based telescope. And what we have here is you can't really separate them. You can't separate Pluto from its moon. So what we, what we see here is so sort of like a one blob. Okay. So um, then obviously, you know, the, one of the biggest factor over there was atmospheric turbulence. Okay. Uh, when we had then the Hubble telescope uh, start taking pictures above the atmosphere. So then this uh, basically the problem that we had with the Earth-based telescope basically went away. And then you have much clearer, you know, let's say view of the, the, the space around it uh, without the, you know, atmospheric turbulence. So then the, you know, obviously the, the Hubble Space Telescope also had a much better optics. And so we were able to take pictures and you can clearly see then uh, the Pluto and Charon, the, the moon and the, and the planet. Well, right now it's a dwarf planet, but still you can clearly see the Pluto and its moon uh, resolved as two different, you know, uh, bright objects. All right, so let's look at a few examples here. What is the approximate size of the smallest object on the earth that astronauts can resolve by eye when they are orbiting 250 kilometers above the earth? Assuming lambda is equals to 500 nanometer and a pupil diameter of five millimeters, means the light entering your, um, your eye, right? All right, so now in this case, uh, obviously our eye is, you know, you can model the circular uh, and you're given the diameter as five millimeters. That means that's basically the, you know, the example of um, a circular aperture, right? So we can then say the diameter is five millimeters Wavelength is 500 nanometers. Okay. And then we're given uh, basically distance, right? 250 kilometers. So this equals to 250 times 10 to the three meters. That's basically kilometers. All right. So then um, what we end up with is uh, we want to calculate the approximate size of the smallest object. So then, um, well, let me actually use L for the, you know, uh, 250 kilometers. So um, this is in terms of then um, calculating the theta min, which is equals to 1.22 lambda over D. Okay. So, uh, and one of the things we can have here is since um, sine of theta is equals to lambda over d and approximately tangent of theta, which is then equals to then uh, y over l. So then we can then just basically replace lambda over d with y over l. Okay. So uh, basically, that in a way, like th those are, you know, equal to one another. Sorry, I missed 1.22 over there. All right, so that means uh, one, one thing I can say here is uh, theta min, which is equals to 1.22 lambda over D, then is equals to Y over L. Okay, basically using that uh, small angle approximation because they all, you know, equals to uh, a theta. Okay. That means what I have here, 1.22 lambda over D is equals to then Y over L. Okay, where Y is basically that size that we are looking for, which is approximate size of a smallest object. So rearranging this, then y is equals to 1.22 lambda L over the diameter. Okay, and 1.22 times the 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters, then times the length, which is um, 250 times 10 to the three meters, then divided by the diameter, which is then 500 times 10 to the negative three meters. Okay. So then we can calculate Y to be 30.5 meters. That means um, 
if the object is uh, 30.5 meters, then we will find we'll be able to see it, you know, um, so like the, the features of the object, right? So it will be sharp enough for a, for an astronaut to understand what it, what he's looking at. It has to be like about 30.5 meter long. That's the smallest object uh, astronaut can resolve. Okay. Here's another example. Um, an impressionist painter, George Sura, created paintings with an enormous number of dots of pure pigment, each of which was approximately two millimeter in diameter. The idea was to have colors such as red and green next to each other to form scintillating canvas, such as his masterpiece, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte. All right, so I have an image of that in the next slide. Assume that lambda equals 500 nanometers and uh, a pupil diameter of five millimeters, beyond what distance would a viewer be unable to discern individual dots on the canvas? And that's kind of like the idea. So if you're too close to the to this canvas, you'll be able to see those individual dots, okay? But you know, when you go back, then you basically are not able to you know, distinguish the dots so then you can see the entire image. So like, let's say in kind of continuous you know, the, 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 the colors, right? You know, going back and forth between green and yellow and thing like that. So anyway, so kind of like, that's, that's sort of like the point of this type of image that, you know, uh, some of those impressionist images, right? You have to look from, uh, from a little bit, you know, uh, a distance so that you can actually uh, be able to, you know, enjoy them. Anyway, so here's the, the image that we have. So um, again, if you kind of like look at very closely you should be able to see those dots, okay? But if you kind of go back, then you, uh, you're unable to see those dots individually anymore. And then you, I guess, you know, end up admiring the, the painting. In terms of then what we want to do here is we want to, uh, let's say then calculate the distance, okay? Again, so this is in terms of, uh, since we're talking about uh, the wavelength and we're given the diameter, it means, you know, D is equals to 5.00 millimeters, which is 5.00 times 10 to the negative three meters. Wavelength is 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters. And then we wanna find basically the distance. Okay. Again, when the pupil is wide open, um, then it appears that the resolving power of human vision is limited by coerceness of light sensor on the retina. Uh, what we have here is we can then calculate the theta minimum, which is equals to 1.22 lambda over D. But I showed you in, you know, in the previous example is that we can also say that this is equals to um, D, over, uh, D over L, where D is basically the Y, right? So Y over L or D over L, which is the, the distance, right? The size. Um, and then we can just... Uh, Again, so D is the distance between um, uh, between those dots. L is then the distance that you will be standing. So like, let's say this would have been in terms of if this is, you know, let's say, remember if this is like, let's say the slit and this is the screen, this is the L, right, the distance. But if you, you know, talking about, let's say uh, the human eye, right, here's the pupil. So how far away you should be in order to, you know, not be able to see those or, or the minimum amount of, you know, to see those dots. All right, so they're rearranging, solving for L. So this will be then uh, D times diameter over 1.22 times the wavelength. So then um, two times 10 to the, that's two, two millimeters, I, you know, I did not write that down. So D is equals to two times 10 to the negative three meters. Then times the diameter, which is five times 10 to the negative three meters then divided by 1.22 times the wavelength, and that's 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters. All right, so calculating 16.4 meters. Okay. That means beyond what distance would the viewer be unable to discern individual dots? Well, 16.4 meters. That means if you're, you know, about 20 meters from that, from the painting, then you should be able to admire then uh, the painting without being able to um, resolve the individual dots. 
All right, again, it's a beautiful painting. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about here is the diffraction grading. All right, so for the diffraction grading, what we have here is we have not a single slit, not double slit, but n number of slits, which is generally uh, relatively large. So, um, and they're very useful, especially when you're talking about uh, spectroscopy and things like that. So, uh, thing like this. So the, the idea for this is kind of similar. You have the light uh, incoming, you know, a uh, plane wave of light coming in and then instead of like, let's say one or two slits, uh, then you have uh, basically so sort of like an N number of slits. And then the light, you know, goes through that and you can see, right? So you, you see there's sort of like a pattern. So there's a central or the zero order maximum, M equals zero. And then there's a first order maximum and then the first order maximum on the other side. They, that means you have, this, these are for the, for the maximum. So you have a constructive interference, uh, M equals zero, and then another two, M equals one, M equals minus one, another two, N equals plus two, minus, minus two, and so on and so forth. So uh, that means, you know, uh, what, what we can do here is kind of go back and looking at the maximum as we, as we did for the double slit. All right, so in case, right, you have transmission grading. So made by cutting parallel grooves on glass, on glass plate with precision ruling machine. So spaces between grooves, transparent to light, act as separate slits. And then we have a reflection grading made by cutting parallel grooves on the surface of a reflective material. And a reflection of light from uh, spaces between grooves, specular. Remember there's a specular and diffusive, right? Reflection. So uh, specular means, you know, it's smooth surface. So the, all the lights are parallel to one another and reflection from grooves cutting to material diffuse. So you can have either one or the other one. All right, so you can see then what we have is that um, current technology can produce grading that have very small slit spacing. Okay, And one of the things we have about the fraction grading is that sometimes you want to look at in terms of how many grooves per distance you have. So let's say grooves uh, or lines or grooves per millimeter or per centimeters and things like that. For example, typical grading ruled with uh, 5,000 grooves per centimeter, a slit spacing of, so you, what you do, you take then D, which is the spacing between the uh, uh, the slits to be one divided by how many grooves per length you have. So if you're told that you have 5,000 grooves per centimeter, then you take D is equals to one over 5,000 to get the distance between the slits, which is uh, two times 10 to negative four centimeters or about 0.2 uh, millimeters. All right, so one thing we have about the, you know, the, the diffraction grading here is that uh, generally the data is very large. So um, one of the things we have here is the mathematics, right, of the diffraction grading is uh, pretty much identical to the uh, mathematics of the, um, let's say for the, for the bright fringes, right, to the, to the double slit. That means we have D sine theta equals M times lambda or M equals zero for the central one, plus minus one for the first maximum, plus minus two for the second order maximum, plus minus three for the third order maximum, and so on and so forth, okay. The only di difference here is theta is, cannot be considered as theta uh, small anymore. That means sine of theta will not be equal to the, to the theta, will not be equal to the tangent of theta anymore, okay. So this basically just uh, gets thrown away for the uh, diffraction grading. That means what you end up with here is always calculating in terms of the sine of theta, in terms of the, you know, our equivalent, right? So y is equals to L tangent of theta, okay? That means you, you're you stuck with those equations, right? So yes, you can calculate the theta from this equation, right? For example, the, the sine, the theta is equals to inverse sine of uh, M lambda over D. Yeah, you can do that, right? So you can calculate the theta and then the same theta then can be used here to to calculate the, you know, let's say the vertical position, right? Uh, for the for the first order maximum, second order maximum and so on and so forth. But the idea here is that you cannot combine them into, uh, let's say uh, one equation where then what you have here is um, sine of theta, tangent of theta is approximately theta. That, that's, you know, that's basically the no longer applied here. Okay. So, but in any case, uh, the idea here is whenever you are calculating the, the angular position, 
So here you can, you know, pretty much this will remember. So this will be in degrees, right? So this will be in degrees, um, no longer in radians because you are calculating from the inverse sign. Okay. So that means you have an angular position in degrees and then a uh, linear position in meters for that. All right, so um, you can see what, no, what we have here is um, the M order maximum for each wavelength occurs at a specific angle, all wavelengths seen at theta equals zero, which is corresponds to M equals zero. The first order maximum M equals one observed at an angle that satisfy relationship sine of theta bright equals, you know, lambda over D. Okay, so then the second order, um, m equals two, so then equals to then uh, sine of theta bright is equals to two lambda over d, right? And so on and so forth. That means what you have here is this, you know, this is m equals one, this is m equals two and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, one of the other difference here is uh, when we're talking about the pattern that we see on the screen, um, because you have uh, so many slits, right? But the, the, you know, I already mentioned it in a little bit earlier, is that the larger the number of slits, more narrow are gonna be the, um, uh, the graphs for the, for the intensity of the, of, the, um, of the light, of the pattern that you see. So for example, here you see double slit. Okay, you can see, right? So uh, what you have here is uh, you have the central one, and, uh, you know, let's say here's IMAX, right? And this, you know, uh, what you see here is uh, the distance between them, right? Uh, and um, compared to that with the diffraction grading, right? Uh, those graphs are much more narrower, okay? So you can see, compare sharpness of the principal maximum broadness of dark areas compared to the bright uh, fringes, characteristics of two slits interference. Uh, because a principal maxima are so sharp for grading, much brighter than two slit interference maxima, okay? So it means, you know, instead of like being like this, they kind of go like that, okay? So like, you know, in terms of like that. All right, so uh, generally what we have here is that diffraction grading is very useful for, you know, it has very useful applications. So you can see, right, uh, one of the things we can do here is a way to measure the wavelength of light uh, is called diffraction grading spectrometer, okay? Um, the collimated beam is incident on the grating, the diffracted light leaves the grating and the telescope is used to view the image. So one of the things we can do here, we can use this to uh, basically look at the light coming from a distant star and then get information about it. So we can be able to see uh, the type of signatures of the light, the type of, you know, uh, let's say the, the molecules or gases it interacted with um, we should be able to, we usually use diffraction grading in experiments, right, in the laboratories uh, to look at, for example, uh, hydrogen, you know, uh, and look at very specific signature of hydrogen compared to helium, which has a very specific signature. And diffraction grading allows us to see those, those patterns because when the light goes through hydrogen, it basically has very unique signature because uh, you have different, uh, different, let's say, wavelengths, right, different, you know, let's say the, the, different absorption and emission. So like a pattern for those. Okay. So uh, you can see the wavelength can be determined by measuring the precise angle at which the images of the slit appear for various orders. So we have also, you know, the atomic spectroscopy where the light from an atom is analyzed and used to identify the atom. So that's kind of what we have. That means you can look at the distance star, look at the light coming from a distant star and using atomic spectroscopy, you know, uh, figure out what type of uh, elements present in the atmosphere of that. So you can look at in terms of, does it have hydrogen? Does it have uh, helium? Does it have, I don't know, let's say carbon and so on and so forth. And all is done by uh, looking at the light going through the diffraction grading, because then you can pretty much, you know, do they, you know, like let's say uh, the atom is analyzed and used to identify those things. All right, so let's look at an example here. A uh, light from an argon laser strikes a diffraction grating that has 5,310 groups per centimeter. So the central and first order principal maxima are separated by 0.488 meters on a wall 1.72 meters from the grating. Okay. Uh, determine the wavelength of the laser light. Okay, so that means what we have here is 
uh, were given in terms of a number of grooves per centimeters. Okay, so which is 5,300. So that means we have 5,310 5, grooves per centimeters. And then uh, we're told that the central and first order maxima ha have a separation of 0.488. Okay, so that means um, we can take this to be the, you know, Y, which is the vertical position, right, between, um, between them. So things like this. So I don't know, so let's say something like this. And let's say here's the screen. And um, I don't know, I guess I'll, I will, I should have, let me, let me use different colors. So then red, I'll, I'll use for the bright. All right, so let's say, so these are my, uh, you know, diffraction grading. Here's the screen. Let's say this is uh, L. And uh, what I have here is that this is my central one. And then let's say this is my first order, right? That means I can say that this is M equals zero. This is M equals one. And their distance between them is given as 0.488 meters, which is, you know, Y1, right? So that means that the position of the first maxima relative to the, uh, the central one. Okay. And what we have here is an L is 1.72 meters. And then in terms of this information is information about uh, basically way of finding D, which is the distance between the, you know, the slits. Okay. So again, Y is uh, 0 0.488 meters. All right, so next let's then do this calculation because one of the things we have, we have D sine of theta is equals to M times Lambda. Okay, remember where N equals zero plus minus one plus minus two, that, that, that. Okay. So when M equals to one, and that's what we have, right? So D sine of theta is equals to just Lambda. Okay. So, uh, but we also have where um, L tangent of theta is equals to Y. Okay. Remember, so we cannot, use a small angle approximation anymore. So that means one thing I have here is, this is the equation that I need for the, for the wavelength, because that's what we want, right? It means I need to, this sign of theta gives me wavelength. I have D, um, you know, at least way of finding D, um, but I don't have theta. So, but I can use L tangent of theta um, because this is equals to Y and I'm given Y to find the theta. Because from here, then tangent of theta is equals to y over l, and then tangent it, it, the the theta equals inverse tangent of y over l. Okay, so inverse tangent of y is uh, 0.488 uh, meters divided by l, which is 1.72 meters, and I can calculate this to be 15.8 degrees. So you can see, right? It's a, it's a large data, so I can't use the small angle approximation. All right, so now that I have this, um, next thing I will need to do too is to find D, but D is always equals to one divided by, you know, number of grooves per centimeter. So let's say in this case, five, three, one, zero. See, like, let's say grooves per centimeters. Uh, and if I calculate this, so I will get 1.88 times 10 to the three, um, well, uh, times two to three nanometers. And I will explain why I'm using nanometers here. So you can calculate in terms of centimeter, but convert it into nanometers. Because I know one thing that the wavelength of the light is gonna be some nanometers. And then when I, when I write wavelength is equals to D sine of theta. Now my D is 1.88 times 10 to the three nanometers, then times sine of 15.8 degrees. So my answer then will be 514 nanometers. So that will be then the value of this. Okay, that means I can calculate the wavelength of the light and it's 514. So it's a roughly a green color, right? All right. Okay. All right, so then the last thing we have here is uh, polarization of light uh, or light waves. Uh, one of the things we have here is the polarization is sort of like an application um, that was um, discovered, you know, um, actually by um, 
the person that we already talked about earlier, and that was um, Arago, if you remember, right? Uh, Francois Arago, who gave us the, um, the experiment to verify that you will see a central bright spot at the center of the, you know, um, let's say uh, circular, you know, uh, object. So he also, you know, uh, came up with experiment to, you know, um, for the polarization. Now, one thing that we have about light is that we learned that light is a combination of electric magnetic, you know, vectors, right, uh, the waves. Um, so you can think of like, let's say, uh, when you talk about light, it's electric magnetic vectors associated with an electromagnetic wave. And uh, one of the, you know, uh, let's say, images that you would always see for the light is when you have, um, let's say, this is the z-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis. And then what we have here is, um, let's say, this is the electric field, which is generally considered to be a vertical, let me kind of. So let's say here's the electric field, which is oscillates with time, right? And then this is then the magnetic field which also oscillates with time. So then if I do this, like, let's say like that, you then can see that uh, what we have here is sort of like, let's say the, the wave pattern, right? So let's say the wave pattern of the um, electromagnetic wave pretty much from here. But that means, you know, in a way what I can think of like light is always to be, you know, electric field vertical and a magnetic field horizontal. But let's, let's assume that this. So light always has, let's say electric field like this, but it's oscillates, it also oscillates like this back and forth like that and so on. So that means, you know, why is the axis, right? The electromagnetic electric wave vector always oscillates back and forth in the y-axis. Same thing with the a magnetic wave in a, in a xz axis. So that means the light uh, is electro, you know, the electric, let's only consider it an electric. So then electric wave of the light always have, let's say every direction like this, you know, along that, you know, yz plane. So it always have any direction you can think of. And it does one at a time, but it does so fast then when you look at it, you can think of like, let's say, okay, so but every second it has some kind of direction. So you can kind of like, you know, have something like this. Okay. That means a direction of polarization is defined to be the direction which the electric field is vibrating. So we can think of it like that. And since electric field is vibrating, you know, every direction, you know, uh, we can call this uh, unpolarized or, or, you know, natural light. So unpolarized or natural light, okay. Now, then what we have here is, here's an image of that, right? So um, when you're talking about, let's say then um, the natural or unpolarized light, right? It, it vibrates at all directions. So all direction of vibration from a wave source are possible. So that means if this is some kind of light source, so then it generates electric field in every direction. So then if the light is moving, if like it's propagating like this, you can think like, let's say it has all the direction. Okay. Again, so this is an unpolarized wave, okay. and or sometimes we call it natural natural light. So now, um, one thing that we have here is you know Arago was able to design a device that basically um, polarizes the light. Now, what is what does it mean polarizes the light? So it's a device that basically takes the light, which has every single direction, right? And um, when the light goes through this device. So let's, since I don't have much space in this direction, let me kind of do it in the opposite direction. So let's say the light is moving like this. Okay. So then uh, what we do here, we put some kind of device. So let's say here's a circular. Polarizer can be circular or rectangular, or you know, let's say it's a circular, you know, polarizer. Now this polarizer has axis. Okay, so special sort of like, let's say type of, you know, a polarized molecules and thing like that. And it has axis that is, you know, either horizontal or vertical. So basically thing like this. So these are the axis of a polarizer. Okay, so light now is vertical. So let's say that's the axis of a polarizer. Okay. So now as the light then goes through the polarizer, okay. So uh, everything there is parallel to this, all the light, there's the light basically parallel to the polarizing axis or axis of polarizer, 
will propagate through. But other parts, other light, right, that are not parallel to the polarizing axis, or, you know, the plane of polarization, you can say, then end up being absorbed by the polarizer. Okay, that means again, only the light that is parallel to the axis of the polarizer will go through. That means what I have here is when the light comes out here, it's gonna be polarized exactly same axis as the polarizer. Okay, so that means what we're doing here, we are linearly polarizing the light and polarized, polarized light only has one direction. Remember, non-polarized or unpolarized light has all the directions, right? All the direction of vibration, okay? But the polarized light now has only single direction because it went through a, a polarizer. Okay, now, a wave is said to be, again, linearly polarized if the resultant electric field vibrates in the same direction um, at all times in the particular point. That means always same direction, right? So for example, um, you know, vertical now, okay? And no more horizontal or other direction. So in a way, sometimes what we do is to simplify this, we say that it's a superposition of just vertical and horizontal, right? So ignoring everything else because I can find the projection of this one along the horizontal, projection of this one along the vertical. So just have just those two, horizontal and vertical, okay? Now imagine that if you have a light, unpolarized light, then you can say that it has both horizontal and vertical. And if it's moving like this, right? So then if it's, um, if it's moving on its X axis, let's say, then if you have a polarizer with the axes that are, let's say vertical, then when the light enters this polarizer, right? The polarizer then will absorb everything that is not parallel in this case, uh, the horizontal, it will absorb the horizontal, but then it will allow the, the, uh, the, the vertical to go through. That means now light over here, let's call this point one, which is the position where the light was unpolarized. And then here we have position two where now the light is then uh, polarized. That means the light now propagating with just one direction. All right, so now what can we do from there? Well, or what is the advantage? Well, thing like this, one of the important thing about this polarizing the light here is that the intensity of light at point two is exactly half of intensity at point one. And point one, we assume it's unpolarized. So sometimes we just call this I naught or I max. Okay, so let's, let's, let's use I max, okay. Uh, or let's let's say I naught for example. So then I naught is basically the natural unpolarized in light intensity. Okay. And then as soon as it goes through a first polarizer, intensity is exactly half. Okay, exactly half, and it has one direction, so it's polarized. Well, next what I can do here is I can put another polarizer. Let's let's say or something like this, and then axis of this polarizer will then allow me to either have some of the light propagate through or things like this. If polarizer has axis like this, when this light then enters my polarizer as a vertical, well, my polarizing axis is, is horizontal, then everything will be blocked. So there will be no light. Okay, there will be no light. That means if you're looking through the second uh, polarizer, um, a lot of times this, this is known as an analyzer. Okay, so then there will be no light. Okay, so this is a polarizer. Uh, and the second one generally called its analyzer. So then there will, and if, you, if, if the analyzer and polarizer are perpendicular to one another, you will see no light. Okay, that means you can completely black. That means intensity, let's call this 0 0.3. Intensity 0 0.3 is equal to zero. All right. So again, so it's common to refer the direction perpendicular to the molecular chains as the transmission axis. So this is kind of like transmission axis, which is the, the axis of the polarizer. So an ideal polarizer, uh, all light with the electric field parallel to the transmission axis is transmitted. So this is parallel to that transmission axis. All the light, uh, you know, the, with the electric field perpendicular to transmission axis is absorbed. Okay. Now, as I said, right? So here's a natural light the first polarizer basically let's say having this makes the light linearly polarized and then the second one can block it but for example what if i don't want to completely block it 
And what I can do, I can make this axis not perpendicular. So let's say again, so let me go this axis like that. So I think like this. Now what I have here is this is, you know, one, which is the region where the light was unpolarized, two, where the region is linearly polarized, and three, when I have the light going through the analyzer. So this is a, a polarizer. And this is an analyzer. And then what I have here is this. The analyzer doesn't have to be perpendicular to the, uh, let's say transmission axis doesn't have to be perpendicular to the light. I can maybe have something, you know, such that it has some angle theta relative to the, let's say the, uh, the propagating light. Okay, because now what I can have here is that how much intensity I will have at point three. Uh, remember, intensity at point two is exactly half of the intensity at of the original light and polarized light. Then I three will be equal to then I max. Then times cosine squared theta. Okay, that means I max is the intensity before. In this case, it will be you know intensity at I I you know point two right, which is then one half I, you know. I not the I max is basically intensity, you know, before it goes to the analyzer, then cosine squared theta. So you can see, right, when my transmission axis is perpendicular to the light, theta is 90, cosine of 90 gives you zero. Okay. But if it's not 90, it's like 30, 40, 60, then you have, you know, basically, basically some of the fraction of the light still going through. Anyways, that equation is known as a Malus's law. So Mollus's law basically gives you the intensity of the light uh, after the analyzer. Maybe you can have four or five different, you know, pol you know, you know, polarizers, right? Uh, after the first one. So the first one generally is on the polarizer. Second one is analyzer, and I guess you can call like analyzer one, two, three, so on and so forth. Okay. Because uh, polarizer um, always just drops the intensity to one half, and then analyzers can drop it further. Uh, let's say as much as you want. So like in terms of, um, anyway, so that's kind of what we have. This equation, right, assumes that I max is the intensity, uh, let's say before this particular, let's say this will be, you know, um, for example, if I'm, if I'm using this as, as you know, uh, as two, um, then in this case, um, sorry, like let's say in terms of three, right? Because I have one, two and three. Okay, so I don't use this equation for two. Because you know, I know that I is I two is equals to one half I one. That's for sure. Then I use this always for three. Then this is basically you know what I had at two. Okay, times cosine squared theta. All right. So you can see intensity of the transmitted beam is maximum when the transmission axes are parallel. That means you know this should be theta. Theta equals zero or one eighty degrees. And the intensity is zero when the transmission axes are perpendicular to each other. This would be, you know, this would cause complete absorption. That means no light then will propagate through. All right. So then what we have here is this kind of like, you know, gives you that. Uh, you can see that, you know, let's say here you have a natural light and then you have a polarizer. That's a polarizing light. But then let's say, for example, you have two polarizer and analyzer and uh, their transmission axes are matching. Okay. That means, you know, you see the same light. Okay. Uh, but then if you, let's say, if you rotate the analyzer, then its transmission axis is different compared to the analyzer. So then light is dimmer until, you know, polarizer analyzer have act transmission axis that are perpendicular to one another, then you see basically no light. All right, so you can see, right? So that's why. So the data, you know, basically in a way refers the, to uh, transmission axis of the polarizer and analyzer because the light that's coming out of the polarizer will always line up with the uh, polarizer, okay? And then you're looking at that, that axis, right? Relative to the uh, analyzer axis, the data represents that. All right, so let's look at an example here. So a plain polarized light is incident on a single polarizing disc with the direction of E naught parallel to the direction of the transmission axis. Through what angle should the disc be rotated so that intensity in the transmission beam is reduced by a factor of three, five, and 10? Those are the A, B, and C options. Right? All right, so one thing we know here is that we already have that uh, it's a, it's a uh, plane polarized light. So it's sort of like a two-dimensional, right? So, but, but it's a polarized light and it's a 
incident on a single polarizing disk. So you can think of it like as a, as a circular. Okay. That means we're already dealing with the polarized light. So now what I can then use here is because now it's going to go through another pol you know, another polarizer like analyzer, then I can use the Mollus's law. I is equal to then I max, uh, then cosine squared theta. Okay. Remember, my goal here is to find uh, those, uh, the beam being reduced by a factor of three, five, and 10. Okay. So that means what should the angle be so that I have that? All right. So, um, which means what I'm looking at for part A is when I over I max, because it gives me as a, you know, a factor of three, so like a ratio. So this is equals to, uh, since it's factor of three, that means it's, you know, one third, right? So let's say we want this to be one third. Um, well, which means that, you know, in this equation, if I do I over I max, then this is equal to then cosine squared theta. All right, so then from this equation, if I then square both sides, then I get uh, I over I max, right? Um, sorry not square, but take the square root. Okay. So I over I max then is equals to then cosine, cosine of theta. Okay. Then I can say then, you know, inverse cosine of the square root of I over I max. Okay. That's the, how I would calculate then the, then this theta. Okay. So the first one is factor of one third. This means using this equation, theta is equals to inverse cosine of uh, square root of, you know, basically one third, right? Because I over I max is one third. Okay. So then this will give me 54.7 degrees. Part B, I over I max, then is equals to one, one over five, one, one fifth. So then this will give me theta is equals to inverse cosine of square root of one fifth. So then this will give me 63.4 degrees. And then part C, I over I max is equals to one over 10. So then this will give me theta equals inverse cosine of square root of one over 10. So then this will give me 71.6 degrees. That means those are the polarizing axes that I need to get those, you know, um, this type of, you know, transmission uh, beam reduction, in, you know, let's say ratios. All right, so here's another example. Unpolar, unpolarized light passes through two ideal Polaroid sheets. The axis of the first is vertical. The axis of the second is 30 point, 30 point well, it's, it, this, you know, this is basically degrees, 30 degrees to the vertical. What fraction of the incident light is transmitted? All right, so let's think of it like this. So we have a unpolarized light, which means that it has both axes propagating and then it goes then through the first polarizer. Okay. It says the first polarizer is, has a vertical transmission axis. That means let's draw this here as a vertical. Okay. And it's, it's generally easy to kind of like put this as point one, you know, point one. That's the region where you have an unpolarized light. Then let's say it kind of goes like this. Then that's a, a that's what I have the second polarizer. And let's say then the light is gonna continue like that. All right, so then this is then region two. And when the polarized light goes through the first polarizer, then its axis can always match the polarizer axis. That means the light now gonna be vertical like this. And then the second one we are told has 30 degree to the vertical. That means it's gonna be like this. That means when the light goes through the second polarizer, the analyzer, right? So that's gonna be angle of 30 degrees with that. All right, so now let's, let's see what we have. So this is I1, which is gonna be I naught. This is then I2, which is gonna be one half I naught, right? So because the light going through the first polarizer loses the half of intensity. Then here, let's call this I3, right? Point three, then this will be then I max then times cosine squared theta. All right. So now what I have here is I max, 
is basically the intensity before facing region two, which is one half I naught. Okay, so it's one half I naught. Okay, in a way you can kind of like think of it like that, right? Then um, what I have here is um, cosine squared theta is because now I have a 30 degrees. So cosine, cosine squared theta, if I put 30 degrees, so then for here, I'm gonna get three fourths. Okay. That means my equation becomes like this. I3, that means intensity is region three is equals to one half times intensity uh, at basically region one, right? So basically one half times maximum intensity, then times then cosine squared theta, or no, sorry. Then for the cosine squared theta, basically I put like three, three fourths. Okay. But what we want here is what fraction. Again, that means, you know, I just do a ratio. That means, you know, divide both sides by I naught. Then what I get here is I get so one half. So that's basically the intensity in, decrease in, in, in region two, then times three fourths. And that's the intensity decrease in region three. And then calculating together, I get 0.375. That means you're only gonna have roughly 37.5 or 38 degrees, 38% uh, of the original intensity. That means here you get 50%. And then here you get, let's say, 37.5% decrease. That means, you know, you, you end up with only about 37% of your intensity, original intensity at that position. Right. The, another way we can um, polarize light is by reflection. Okay. So this is generally when the natural or unpolarized light hits goes from medium with one index of refraction to another, which is has a N2, right? A different index of refraction. Remember, some of the light will reflect, some of it will refract. Now, one thing we have here is this. So the polarization of reflected light, that means we're gonna talk about the reflected light. So because this is polarization by reflection. So uh, if the angle of incident is zero, reflected beam is unpolarized. That means if it comes in like this, and then light goes out back a little bit like that, reflected and refracted, this is not polarized. Okay. For other angles of incidence, so let's say where the theta is not theta one is not zero, uh, reflected light polarized to some extent. Okay. There's a you know a partial you know polarization we call. It. And for one particular angle of incident, reflected light completely polarized. Okay. That means for some theta one, remember so. This is, you know, this is theta incident, this is theta reflected, and according to the law of reflection, they're the same. That means they equal what to theta one. Okay. And this is theta two, the light proper, you know, the refracted light, right? Now, the polarization of entire beam can be described by two electric field components. There is a parallel component uh, reflected more strongly than the other component. So result, you have partial polarized reflected beam and a refracted beam, so you can see, right? So let me kind of get rid of this. So those are, you know, in terms of uh, those dots are presented electric field, so the dots are like toward you, toward you and into the page, right? So those are present electric field oscillating parallel to the reflect, reflecting surface and the, you know, and perpendicular to the page, okay? So um, that means those parallel reflect more strongly than the other components, which are the arrows like this, right? Uh, so the result partial parallel reflected beam and reflected beam also partially polarized, refracted beam, sorry. Now, then what we have here is we have um, special, you know, angle, we call it polarizing angle. That means the angle of incidence varies until angle reflect between reflected and refracted beam is 90 degrees. That means if we change this theta one, theta two changes. And then the, obviously, you know, because, you know, theta one here and there exactly the same, that means reflected and refracted at some point can be perpendicular to one another. That means refracted beam only partial, you know, reflected beam completely polarized. In that case, reflected is completely polarized, refracted partially polarized. And angle of incident at which the polarization occurs, basically this polarizing angle theta P, right, is uh, given basically with this equation. So theta P plus 90 
plus theta 2, which is, you know, equals 180, right? So theta P plus 90 plus theta 2, that's basically gives you that angle 180 degrees. That means we can calculate the theta 2 by doing 90 minus theta P because this 90 and 180 gives you 90, then theta 2 equals 90 minus theta P. Okay. And then we put this on a, a Snell's law equation, n2 over n1 equals sine of theta 1 over theta 2, right? Um, you know, then theta 1 is equal to theta p. So then it got, that becomes theta, you know, sine of theta p divided by sine of theta 2. And obviously then theta 2 is equal to that. So you can see from that, right? Since sine of theta 2 equals sine of 90 minus theta p, that's, uh, you know, from one of those intrigue identities equals to cosine of theta p. So which means in this case, we're gonna call this theta p as a Brewster's angle. So then n2 over n1 equals sine of theta p over cosine of theta p, okay? So the discover is the Scottish physicist and mathematician, David Brewster. So then we call this uh, angle theta p, a Brewster's angle. That means Brewster's angle is when the light, reflected light is completely polarized. And it's, it happens when reflected and refracted lights are you know, perpendicular to one another. All right, so in case, right, and varies with wavelength for a given substance. So Brewster angle is also a function of wavelength. Okay, so that we know, you know, from the previous equation, um, because, you know, let's say N is equals to wavelength in vacuum over wavelength in that, in that medium. All right, so again, this equation then can be used to calculate that, you know, uh, Brewster's angle which, you know, sine of P over cosine of P is usually tangent of P. And then we, we kind of, you know, have this final equation for the calculation of theta P, which is the inverse tangent of the N2 over N1, okay. All right, so here's an example then. A light in air strikes a water surface at the polarizing angle. The part of the beam refracted into the water strikes and submerged a slab of material with refractive index um, N equals 1.62 as shown in the figure. The light refract, reflected from the upper surface of the slab is completely polarized. Okay. So then uh, find the angle theta between the water surface and the surface of the slab. All right, so let's see then what we have over here. One of the things we're gonna do here is we know that light, uh, the light strikes the liquid uh, that means this is, let's say, uh, air, right? So let's say I can say that N1 is equals to one, which is that, that that's the air. And then you have then N2 is equals to um, one point, let me do it here, 1.33. And then this is a glass with um, uh, 1.62. Okay, so that's kind of what we have. So from here, uh, we can look at it in terms of, um, you have theta P representing that the light hitting the water from air at, at the Brewster's angle, right? Theta P, which means that we know that those are, those two are perpendicular to one another. Okay. And then we can think of it like this. So um, let me maybe use a little bit different color, right? So um, this is theta two and then this is theta three, okay, theta two, that this is theta three. Now, then uh, one thing we can have here is, uh, we can then have this, you can see right, there's also the theta over there, which is the angle that, you know, slab makes with, with water. Okay. So then they're all related where the theta plus 90 degrees plus theta two, Right, so 90 plus theta two uh, plus the 90 degrees minus theta three, and this is equals to 180, all right. That means, you know, if we calculate that, so that's the relationship we'll get. All right, so from some algebra then uh, we can since 90 plus 90 is 180, I have 180 over there. Uh, then what we end up with theta 
plus theta two minus theta three equals zero, then theta theta uh, is equals to the difference between theta three and theta two. Okay. All right. So now, now that we have that, our goal will be then to go and find those theta three and theta two, so we can do this calculation. So um, in terms of then, um, we can calculate you know um, theta p. Uh, let's say theta p here is using the you know the equation for the Brewster's angle. Tangent of theta p is equals to um, index over fraction of water divided by index over fraction of air. So this will be 1.33 divided by one. So uh, which is like 1.33. Then using uh, inverse tangent of 1.33, we'll get then theta p to be 53.1 degrees. Okay. Then what I can say here is now that I have theta p, uh, and I know the med you know medium index of a fraction of one and two, I can then easily solve for two using the Snell's law. So um, n1 sine of theta one equals n2 sine of theta two, where theta one is theta p. So then I can solve for theta two, which will equals to inverse sine of uh, sine of theta p, which is fifty three point one divided by index of fraction of water one point three three. So then theta two here is equals to thirty six point nine degrees. So that's one thing I needed. Then uh, for the water uh, to slab interface. Then what I have here is um, using again, uh, Brewster's angle, tangent of theta three um, is since, you know, that's same as this one, theta three, right? So um, this is equal to then tangent of theta P. So which is equal to an index over fraction of the, of that slab divided by index over fraction of water. And we have that information, right? So it's uh, 1.62 over 1.33. So then using that, we can calculate theta three to be uh, 50.6 degrees. So we got that as well. Then we go back here and say, all right, so now that I have those, I have theta three, which is 50.6 degrees minus theta two which is 36.9 degrees, then get 13.7 degrees as the angle theta. All right, so that will be, uh, the, you know, the angle between water surface and the surface of the slab. All right, so then the last thing here we have is the polarization by scattering. Okay, so this one uh, where the sunlight, let's say comes and enters our atmosphere, um, then the air molecules basically absorb and remit the light. And uh, what happens here is then uh, the light that, remember, so the natural light from the sun has all the colors of the rainbow, right? And the some of the, you know, uh, molecules um, uh, basically absorb the photons of light, but they don't necessarily absorb uh, all of them or not all of them at the same rate. So one thing we have here is um, when they absorb, generally, you know, a smaller, the wavelength of the particular light, um, more it, it is being absorbed. And one thing we know here is that, for example, red color has a longer wavelength than the violet color. Violet color from the visible spectrum of the light, right, is the shortest wavelength. And then the red is the longer wavelength. So that, that means, you know, this absorption and re-radiation or re-emission of light by electrons in air molecules is what we call um, polarization by scattering. Okay, that means all the, you know, the electrons, right? You know, all the, you know, the, the molecules and things like that in our atmosphere, they absorb and they re-emit. Sometimes they re-emit in our direction, sometimes in a different direction. But that, the, the idea here is that, you know, generally, for example, red 
you know, can go through the air molecules without being uh, scattered too much. But for example, the smaller wavelength light, violet and blue, end up being, you know, much more scattered. So the, the violet obviously being the most. So then the sunlight becomes polarized when scattered. So similar to creating completely polarized light upon reflection from a surface uh, Brewster's angle. Now the unpolarized beam of sunlight traveling in horizontal directions strike molecular of gas, setting electrons of molecule into vibration. Then what we have here is that you can think of like, let's say there are two types of vibration, right? So you have the uh, horizontal and vertical, you know, vibration for the, uh, for the air molecules. Now, uh, vibrating charges act like vibrating charges in antenna. So we have horizontal components of electric field vector in incident wave result in horizontal components of vibrating charges. And then the vertical component of the vertical results in the vertical component of vibration. So then when you look at the, let's say, when you look at the light, right, you are basically looking at a different, you know, uh, direction vibration light. So if observer looks at the, the direction perpendicular to the original direction of the propagation of light, so then you see the vertical oscillating of charges sent to send no radiation toward the observer. And uh, observer sees light completely polarized in horizontal direction. Uh, so this does, you know, orange arrows over there. Okay. So if observer looks in other direction, light partially polarized in horizontal direction. Okay. So now, um, so what we have here is, as I mentioned, right, the, the wavelength of each color is different. Okay. So, um, Case, right, so the light of various wavelengths, incident and gas, molecules of diameter. So if diameter, you know, much smaller than the, the wavelength, then the relative intensity of scattered light varies as one over lambda to the four. Okay. So then what we have here, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen molecules, right? Um, and uh, their diameter about roughly about 0.2 nanometers. So that means the light uh, has to be compatible to that in order to be absorbed. So that's why the, the violet is being the smallest wavelength is being absorbed more, is being absorbed and remitted more. So basically scattered more, okay? So, and that's why, uh, for example, when we look at the sky, uh, we look at uh, most, you know, let's say the, the absorbed and scattered light. But obviously, you know, our eyes are not sensitive to violet, which is the most, so then we see the second most, which is the blue. So that's why when you look at the sky, right, during the daytime, you see blue because blue is the most scattered, you know, light that is, you know, our eyes are sensitive to, okay? So the red, you know, in a way thing like this, right? So if you're here, okay. So then the, they're all coming in. So for example, so let's say these are the red, so the red coming in and they're not being absorbed. For example, and you, and you see one red. This got here, this goes there. So then you see one red. But then what you have is that then the blue becomes scattered a lot. So it becomes scattered a lot. And then you have a blue coming from one molecule, then another one, another one. So then what you see, you have, you see much more blue because they're being scattered and moving, let's say, you know, in your direction where you can see that, let's say only red, like one of the reds moving toward your direction. So you see way more blue than you see red or other colors so that's why to you the you know the skies appear to be blue because where you know you when you look at the sky you see like let's say maybe a billion times more you know blue you know let's say the the photons reaching your eye because they're being absorbed and remitted in you know random direction okay so again short wavelength radiation scattered more intensely than long wavelength all right so then uh that's kind of like that so when you look at the sky and uh, you see scattered light, violet, but our eyes don't see the violet, so we see blue, okay? And our eyes is basically much more sensitive to that. Well, that's definitely not the blue, blue skies, but you know, that's pretty much would be, um, you know, what you see during the, the sunset. If you look toward the west at sunset, uh, you're looking in the direction towards sun. So let's say then why do you see red, you know, uh, sunset are red, let's say compared to the daytime when it's blue. Well, it depends on in terms of how they're, they, they're scattered, right? In this case, most blue light has been scattered by air between you and the sun and things like this. So let's say when you're here, 
the sun is not coming like directly like that, but it's going like this. So sun is somewhere over here, right? So then uh, what you see that the, the blue that being scattered, most of them kind of like scattered like this, but the red kind of moves towards you. So that means now the, it, it is dominated by red because you know, since you're here, most of the blue down is scattered somewhere over here and you only see more red than blue, okay? So that's why the most blue light has been scattered by air between you and the sun and light that survives much of its blue components scattered and heavily weighed towards red end of the spectrum. Result, you see red and orange colors of sunset or sunrise, right? But when the you know sun is more overhead, then obviously you see more blue scattered light than you see, let's say, a red color. All right, so then this concludes our chapter.